Grab your Bible, friends, if you would, please, and open it to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1. Matthew, chapter 1, beginning with verse 18. And we're going to continue our, our little Christmas miniseries called Seeker this morning. And as you turn into Matthew, chapter 1, let me say something to you that you, you already know. Let me call it to your attention. There are some moments in life, in all of our lives, that are hard to come back from, Okay. You know, you say the wrong thing at the wrong time, and you say to yourself, oh my goodness, how, how am I going to come back from that? You do the wrong thing, or you, you fail to do the right thing, and, and all of a sudden everybody's looking at you differently at work, or in your family, or, or in your neighborhood, and you think, boy, that's going to be tough to come back from. That's going to be hard to come back from. Maybe you made a promise, and you meant it, but you couldn't keep it tough to come back from. Maybe you forget something important and you miss a chance that won't come aground again and you feel like that'll be tough to come back from. Maybe you're on the one yard line at the end of the Super Bowl and you call a pass play and you know that's going to be tough to come back from. For years it's going to be tough to come back from. Yeah. Life is full of moments like that. I remember when Ron and I moved into a new apartment building when we went to Bible college and it was filled with students attending Bible college and, and I was coming back to the house on a summer evening uh, trying to make friends, trying to connect with our neighbors and I was returning from playing basketball and I walked by a, an apartment where the door was open and people were sitting on chairs in a circle and I thought to myself, it's a Bible college, they're sitting on chairs in a circle, it's a small group meeting. And I thought, cool. I thought, well, this is my chance to say hi. So I just walked right in the door and I said, hey, everybody, what do we have here? An Amway meeting? <laughs> yeah, that's what we had there. And uh, the host, my neighbor who I'd never met before, looked at me and said, well, well yes, actually, you know. I'm out. This is going to be impossible to come back from, right? I just... Life is filled with moments like that. You've had some, I've had some. But sometimes amazing comebacks do happen. Sometimes stuff that we would say, this is impossible to come back from. Sometimes those comebacks do happen. You know, Ron and I are, uh, are big Sounders fans. A few of us here at MRCCR, we stay in touch with each other. That's the soccer team in Seattle, in case you didn't know. And uh, this week was kind of the culmination of the soccer season in America, the, the, the equivalent of the Super Bowl. The MLS Cup was last night. Monday night, the Sounders were playing a game to get into that championship game. And they were that close. And Ron and I were excited about it. And some of our friends were as well. And we were talking about it all day and looking forward to the game. And hey, if we win this, we're going to the Super Bowl, you know. And I had to teach a class that night uh, here. I, I got to teach a class that night uh, during the game. And uh, I knew my class was going to go through the first half of the game. And, and I knew I would get home a little bit after halftime. So I was just on pins and needles. And you know, the last thing I said to the class after I left was, I said, hey, you guys, I'm excited to go watch the Sounders game. Hopefully when I get home, we'll be up six to nothing. <laughs> we weren't up six to nothing when I got home. As a matter of fact, when I got home, it was the start of the second half, and we were just getting killed. <laughs> I thought for a minute I must be watching a Mariners game. That's what it felt like, you know, in the moment. <laughs> was, what is going on here? And, and I sat down and Rhonda was bummed and she, was, she said, we're playing awful. I don't know how to explain it. And after I sat there for about 10 minutes, I started saying, what is the problem? Pretty soon, you know, we're mad at the dog. We're mad at each other. This is not going the way we planned. And it just kept getting worse. It got to the 75th minute and, and not only was the other team, Minnesota, playing a lot better than us, but, you know, if you're down two to nothing in the 75th minute of a soccer game and it's only 90 minutes long, it's hard to score. That's like being down, you know, 35 to nothing in a football game. So we're just sitting there feeling hopeless. We started to say to each other, well, you know, there were some fun points in the season. And then... And then they made a substitution. Not my favorite guy on the team. Actually, I don't like it when they sub him in, but they did. And he came onto the field, and within 90 seconds, he scored. And suddenly, it was two to one. And now, that looks a lot different. And now, Ron and I are sitting up. We're on the edge of our seats. And wow, we, one more, and we could maybe force overtime. We got a chance here. And 
Sure enough, about six minutes later, boom, another goal. We're just delirious, two goals in seven minutes. I mean, sometimes in a soccer game, you go days without a goal. And there was two in like seven minutes. And I was like, wow, this is awesome. And we're thinking, you don't think, you don't think they can get another one, do you? <laughs> and in the last minute of the game, they scored a third goal. We went nuts at our house. Neighbors are calling the police. It was, you know, it was a... <laughs> We're just whooping and hollering. It turned into this incredibly exciting. It didn't start out that way. It started out looking bad, but at the end it was amazing. And, you know, I got to thinking about it later. Do you know what happened while we sat there in our living room was our understanding of what was possible and what was impossible changed. There was a moment when we sat there and we thought, there's no coming back from this. You know, it's just, it's too deep a hole. We're in a funk. It's just not going to happen. And then something that felt impossible turned out to be not only possible, but it actually happened. I share that story with you because God wants to talk to us about comebacks this morning. He wants to talk to us about the kind of comeback that Christmas is all about. This morning, God wants to talk to us about comebacks because Christmas is the story of a comeback nobody thought possible and of God bringing the same kind of thing into each of our lives. Turn to Matthew chapter 1 this morning. Let's begin with verse 18. We want to work through Matthew in a little bit in Luke and then finally in John this morning. Each of the Gospels, church, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, each, each one has a focus. Mark is short, pithy, fast-moving. It was designed for missionary work. It was written to, to share the Gospel across cultures, across uh, generations and boundaries. Luke is long and chronological, very thorough and investigative. It, it, it's the easiest gospel for us Western people to relate to because it shares our values. John is more mystical. It's focused not on chronology, but on the, the seven great I am statements of Jesus. I am the bread of life. I am the water of life and so on. John's gospel is much easier for Eastern people to relate to at first. And let us not forget that, you know, probably three quarters of the world's population comes from that kind of a background, from an Eastern background. Matthew, though, is the most Jewish of the four gospels. And it revolves, it is focused on how Jesus fulfills all of the prophecies made about Messiah throughout Jewish history. Or to put it another way, Matthew is focused on calling our attention to the fact that God always does what he says he'll do. That even though it may take a lot longer than we think, and even though it may happen in ways different than we inspect, God always is faithful to his word. Whatever promise he makes, he carries out. Matthew wants us to feel that. Matthew wants us to see that. And it's evident right from the beginning when he tells the Christmas story. Here's what the Bible says, beginning with verse 18 of, of chapter 1 of Matthew. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, uh, we could digress on that for quite a while. What does a righteous man look like? He looks like Joseph. Because Joseph was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, uh, again, a subject for another time, after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. God is on the move. God is at work. It's going to happen in your world. It's going to happen in the world. Don't be afraid. That's what this is. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. The word Jesus means the Lord saves. 
And as soon as he lays out that kind of bare bones plot of the Christmas story, listen to what Matthew immediately calls our attention to, verses 22 and 23. Matthew says, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said. Through the prophet, the virgin will be with child, Isaiah in this case. The virgin will be with child, will give birth to a son. They will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. All this took place to fulfill, Matthew says. Now, the God with us part is unbelievably beautiful. We're going to circle back to it in about 10 minutes. But let me call your attention right now to the phrase, all this took place to fulfill. This Christmas invasion of God into the world as a human being was and is something God was working on for a long time. It was the plan from the beginning. By the way, no no religion in the world apart from the Christian faith has anything like this. In no other faith does the maker, the creator, the God of glory and galaxies and all creation humble himself and become not only a human being, but a child born in a manger to a poor family. Only in the Christian faith is that the story. Matthew says it took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. He says it again. Look at verse 15 of chapter 2. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet. Out of Egypt I call my son. Talking about another part of the story. Again, in uh, verse 23 of chapter 2, so was fulfilled what was said through the prophets, he will be called a Nazarene. We could go on and on. Again and again, Matthew's going to say, hey gang, understand something. When God promises something, nothing is more sure. It will come to pass. Might take some time. Might occur in a way you didn't expect. You shouldn't be surprised by that. But Matthew says when God moves, it's because he has promised to move and he is fulfilling his word. Nothing in all the world is more sure and certain than the word of God. That's why Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words won't. This is solid, eternal, real stuff. Matthew wants us to feel that. He is pointing out that everything that was happening at Christmas was promised by God beforehand. And by the way, the fact that it was promised beforehand means that it's possible to know what God is doing or what God is going to do in the most significant ways ahead of time. Sometimes we think that this Christmas story was a big surprise, that nobody saw this plot line working itself out, but that's not true. The scripture tells us about a number of people who knew exactly what was going to happen, who were expecting it, who were watching it, who recognized it in the moment. For Ron and I, two of our most favorite characters in the Christmas story are a couple of older folks you can read about in Luke chapter 2. Their names are Simeon and Anna. Both of whom, because of a life devoted to God, knew what God was up to, so much so that when the baby Jesus was brought into the temple, Simeon took him in his arms and said, Oh, this is the one. This is it. Wow, here it is. I've been watching for this all my life. I knew God was up to this. It's happening right here. Anna, the same way. She saw the Christ child and she rejoiced and prayed over him and said, oh yeah, this is God at work in the world. They weren't the only ones. Maybe you heard of the three wise men, the three magi who came from the east, who traveled weeks and months to Bethlehem in Jerusalem because they had listened to the Hebrew prophets, because they knew what the Hebrew prophets said was going to happen. And they knew it must happen because God had said it would, and so they made that journey. You see, it's possible to know what he's up to, but what you have to do, like Simeon, like Anna, like the three wise men, is say to yourself, God, I'm going to pay attention to you. I'm going to listen to your word. I'm going to quiet myself in prayer so that I can hear you. I'm going to worship you, Lord, so that my mind and heart work right and I can recognize what you're doing in the world around me. That great privilege is available to anyone. They experienced it. We can experience it. Shoot, even a Samaritan woman at the well, John tells us in chapter 4, said, I know Messiah's coming. When he comes, that'll be awesome. He'll show us what's up. That's available to us. Matthew wants us to understand that what is happening at Christmas is something God promised beforehand, which we could know if we chose to pay attention, and that it was a plan of his that ended in victory. 
that was aiming for a certain kind of victory all along. Or to put it another way, God was always planning an incredible comeback for Israel, for the people of God, and ultimately, as we're going to see in a moment, for each one of us, you and me. Let me ask you, though, before we get there, do you believe that God is working out an incredible comeback in your world even now? That's what Christmas is about. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. Peace on earth, goodwill to men on whom his favor rests. A Savior is born to you. Matthew calls our attention to the fact that this is a fulfillment of God's promise for one simple reason, and that is that he wants us to understand that God always does what he says, even if it's not on our schedule. When he says to you, as he does in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, that the work he's begun in you, he'll be faithful to complete, you can rest in that. It is the most sure and certain thing you will ever experience in your life. You know, sometimes we, we get into the, the habit of thinking that there are seasons in our lives when God isn't doing anything because we can't see or, or feel or, or maybe understand what he's doing or, or why it's taking so long. Sometimes we're like kids on a long vacation car trip all the time kicking our heels on the seat and saying, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Israel certainly felt like that at this first Christmas. It had been 400 years since the last time Israel had a prophet, Malachi. During that all that long season, they didn't have one. That was the primary way they thought God spoke to them. There was much more to it, always had been, but that was how they thought about it. And during that time, they'd gone from independence to Roman occupation. They'd gone from that great Maccabean renewal that resulted in the Greeks being driven out and the temple restored and the worship restored to being occupied by Rome, to being governed by a corrupt and wicked Herod, to having the church dominated by the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the temple at that time. They felt like this was taking a long time. And most had forgotten that before the long ride, God had made a promise. Micah records it in chapter 5, verse 2. Matthew references it in chapter 2, verse 6. God had said, but you, Bethlehem, nowheresville, in the land of Judah, you are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. In other words, God was saying like a parent in the front seat on that long car ride to the kids, hey, we're going to get there. We're going there. I told you we're going there. We're going to make it. It's going to be worth it. That's where joy comes from. It comes from knowing that the comeback is coming because God said it's coming and because we rest in his promise. You know, um, in 1982, I spent the year living in a foreign country. I lived in Iceland. That was my first year in the military. And uh, when I was stationed there back then, there was no internet. There were no cell phones. And, and so uh, once a week, there was a supply plane that flew up from the States. And they brought us all kinds of stuff. One of the things they would bring us was videotapes of the NFL football games, right? Because we didn't have any access to it up there then. Uh, and, you know, being a Seahawk fan, I would look forward to that. Now, we had a little Armed Forces radio station, and the plane would land on Tuesday. We would listen to the radio and, and know what had happened in the Seahawk game. And what a great feeling it is to pop in the tape. You remember what a videotape is, right? Yeah. To put the tape in of the Seahawk game, knowing ahead of time that you're going to win. Suddenly... That fumble in the first quarter, ah, you say, but no big deal. We're going to come back from this. Those holding penalties, those failed efforts, those dropped passes, all that stuff that drives you crazy, suddenly you're going, well, somehow we're going to overcome that. And it is a great feeling to live in the anticipation of what you know is coming. That's what Matthew wants us to grasp. That's what Matthew wants us to feel. He wants us to live with that. That's why he's calling our attention to the fact that, hey, what God promised happened at Christmas, which means that everything else he's promised is coming. It will come true in your world, in our world. Nothing is more sure than his promise. About five years ago, uh, a lifelong dream for me and Rhonda came true. Ever since we were very young in our 20s, we had this dream, wouldn't it be cool someday to, to go to Europe and ride our bikes around for four weeks? And 
you know, we've talked about it many times over the years and thought, well, it's a cool dream. Wouldn't it be fun? Sometimes we'd lay at night and imagine it. We thought, I don't know if it's ever going to happen. I mean, I don't know that we'd ever have that freedom. I don't know that we'd ever have that opportunity. Don't know that we'd ever be able to do something like that. But about five years ago, things just sort of came together and the church gave us permission and we were able to find plane tickets and do all this stuff. And suddenly, it became a reality. We knew that that next summer we were going to be flying to Europe to ride our bikes around. Can I just tell you that during the six months between when we were promised that that was going to happen and when it happened, there wasn't much that could get us down? (laughs) You know, stuff would go wrong and we'd look at each other and go, whatever, in a few months we're going to Europe. We'd have a fight and at the end of the fight we'd go, well, let's get over that because we're going to Europe on our bikes. Actually, the day before we left, one of the cars broke down. We looked at each other, whatever, we're going to Europe tomorrow on our bikes. It was a great feeling to live with. God wants us to live with that feeling always, knowing that his promise will come to pass. That's what Matthew's calling our attention to. That's why he's saying all this was to fulfill. Friends, can I just encourage you, just as your fellow human being, start to get serious about your Bible. When you do, you will discover what God has promised. And the more you discover that and the more you know that he always does what he says, the richer and deeper becomes your expectation. The truth is that anyone who is listening, like Simeon and Anna, like the wise men, would have known that a comeback was coming. But Matthew also wants us to know something else. He wants us to know that when God's comeback happens, it's always bigger and better than they thought it would be. Look again at verses 22 and 23 of chapter 1. We focused on the first part. Let's focus on the second part. The scripture says, All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son. And they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, understand, friends, Israel thought they knew what God with us meant. Their history gave them examples of God with us. It was God with Israel that delivered them from Egypt and wiped out Pharaoh's army. It was God with them that provided manna and quail and water in the wilderness and cared for them on that long journey into the promised land. It was God with us that resulted in a pillar of fire leading them by night, a pillar of cloud by day. It was God with us that gave them the Ten Commandments and God's law. And Israel thought God with us means God crushing our enemies, doing supernatural favors, and telling us what to do at every moment. But God's plan for God with us was much bigger. It was much deeper It was much richer. God's uh, concept of God with us was that he was going to come among us as one of us and enable us to know him the way one man or one woman knows another person. God was going to get much closer to us in a much more personal way than Israel imagined. His plan for Emmanuel was much deeper and much richer. You know, that when, when I was in Iceland that year, when I flew there, I had a girlfriend. Her name was Rhonda. She became my wife. But when I flew there, we didn't know each other super well. We were getting to know each other. We were in the habit of writing letters constantly, and we were in the habit of calling each other when we could. Again, this was before cell phones, so if you called somebody from another state or country, it could cost you a lot of money. And I got into the habit of calling her house, making collect calls, and asking her parents to pay for it. And so, you know, we spent a lot of time talking and getting to know each other. And, you know, there was a certain amount of with each other happening. But after I'd been there a few months, you know, Rhonda wrote this letter and said, you know, she said, I think I'm going to fly up to Iceland and visit you. I thought, yeah, right. Right whatever, you know, that's some 18-year-old airheaded girl talking nonsense. It's not going to happen, right? But I'm just going to go along with it because, you know, we're having the the thing here. And so I, I, oh, that'd be awesome. We could do this and that and the other thing. And 
And then a few weeks later, she wrote again. She says, I'm looking at flights and stuff, and I'm actually going to visit my girlfriend in Washington, D.C. I think I can get a flight from there and come up. And, and I'm like, oh, yeah, no, that's not going to happen, you know. But okay, I'll go along with it, and this is kind of fun. And, and then I got this letter I'll never forget. She said, my plane lands next Saturday. I hope you'll pick me up at the airport. Oh, my goodness. That week is fixed in my memory because that week I began to understand something I really didn't beforehand. I began to understand how with me she wanted to be. That this was more than just two young people sort of flirting in an old-fashioned way. That this, I joke to this day that she chased me halfway around the world, you know, to, <laughs> but it's a joke. The reality was that when she flew up, Suddenly I understood that she was aiming for something much more than I had thought about up to that point. And, and really that was the beginning of the love that's lasted for a lifetime. In the same way, God says, hey, I'm aiming for much more with you than just to bless a few corners of your life and do a few favors and touch you in a few areas. No, 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 no. I, I want to become your best friend Emmanuel, God with us, means that I save you from your sins and more. I, I want you to know your maker. I want you to know your creator. I want you, as Jesus said to the disciples in John chapter 15 on his last night on earth, God wants to know you as a friend even more than a servant. Wow. That's what God meant when he said, you shall call his name Jesus you shall call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. In the Christmas story, we learn that God with us means more than we thought possible. So John tells us in chapter 1, verse 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Philip said to Jesus later in his life, Lord, show us the Father and that'll be enough for us. Jesus said, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Emmanuel means you and me could know his heart, his mind, his passions, what he cares about, what he warns about. And above all, how deep is his love for us personally? That's what God meant when he said, Emmanuel, God with us. He wasn't coming to simply change their circumstances. He was coming to change our hearts. That's why Ezekiel the prophet said in chapter 36, verse 26, another promise God made about Messiah. He said, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you and I'll take away your heart of stone and I'll give you a heart of flesh. In other words, God says, I don't just want to change your outside. I want to change your inside. Because an outside that's all hunky-dory and an inside that is filled with darkness, that's not paradise. God says, Greg, I want to utterly change your heart. That's what I mean when I speak of Emmanuel, God with us. Let me share one last story with you as we get ready to close this morning. A story that's about the kind of comeback God comes to lead in your life and mine. You know, the world says that all our problems are on the outside. Who's running the government? Who's making the laws? Who's controlling the economy? Who's controlling the media? But God knows better. He knows that in our world, the real problem is sin. And so he comes as a savior. Listen again to Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save people from their sins. That's what Christmas is about. It's about God seeking to save us from our sins, to lead a comeback from sin in our lives. And here's what the Christmas child grew up to show us about what that looks like. The last story I share with you, John chapter 8. The Bible says at dawn, he, this Christmas child grown up, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. And the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in the act of adultery. And they made her stand before the group. And they said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman 
was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? The Bible says they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. Yeah, that's what you do when you match, when you mix spiritual causes with earthly ones. You end up ignoring half of the spiritual stuff and choosing to instead chase the earthly stuff. You know, if you get back into the passages that the Pharisees are referring to, you'll find out a few things. You'll find out, first of all, that when someone was caught in adultery and brought for judgment, you didn't just bring the woman, you brought the man as well. In fact, the man should have been here because he bears primary responsibility, biblically speaking, in that moment. And the scripture says that both of them were to be judged in that moment. The Pharisees are not doing that. Why? Because they have a different agenda. This isn't about righteousness. This is about their own issues. But, but let's set all that aside for a moment and let's get more personal about this. Imagine, if you will, yourself in her shoes. The worst and most shameful moment of your life brought out in public before everybody including the rabbi, including the Son of God, including the Messiah. This is an awful moment for her. You want to talk about a moment that it feels like there's no coming back from? That's this for her. She's been caught in, in, a, in a crime that under certain circumstances is punishable by death. She's being brought before everyone with this crime exposed. How would you feel if your worst moment were put on display? That's what she's feeling here. I know a little bit about this. Uh, years ago, I was pastoring in Idaho, and um, you know there was a Seahawk playoff game. Everybody was excited about it. So I said to the congregation at the end of service, hey, we're going to get out of here five minutes early. Let's run home so we can see the game. Yay, everybody. I said, I'm going to set an example for you. I'm going to be the first one out the door. You follow me. Let's go home, you know? And so, you know, we were giggling and laughing, and we headed out. I jumped in my car. I was the first one out of the parking lot, made it a block down to the end of the street in a hurry to get home, missed that stop sign at the end of the street. And who was parked on that corner? One of Idaho's finest. <laughs> Flipped on his lights and pulled me over. And I got to stand by the side of the road getting a ticket while the whole church drove by on the way to the Seahawks game. <laughs> Her moment is not like that. Mine was a silly kind of shame. Hers isn't. Hers is your deepest brought out in public. And in that moment, she has a lot to fear. But her judge, Jesus, responds in a way nobody expected. The Bible says Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. And when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said, if any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. And then again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. In other words, the first thing Jesus does when I point out someone else's sin is ask me if I have any of my own. Jesus in this moment is confronting something called self-righteousness, the greatest and most dangerous of all sins. It's the belief that my being right is more important than my being good. I love what Pastor Paul Tripp says. He says, the test of whether I am self-righteous is whether I feel compassion when I discover someone else's sin or whether I feel vindicated. Jesus feels compassion in this moment because he knows the Christian gospel is about more than being right. It's about being good. That's why John tells us in chapter 1, verse 17, the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ, came through this Christmas Savior. The story goes on to finish. It says, at this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first. I love that. It gives me hope that as I get older, I get more sensitive and aware of my own failures and weaknesses. But anyway, they went away one at a time until only Jesus was left with the woman standing there. And he straightened up and he asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I. I am not here in this moment as your judge. I'm here in this moment as your Savior. And then he invites her 
to begin her own great comeback. He says, go now and leave your life of sin. You knew you were going down the wrong road. You found yourself facing the consequences of your actions on a horrible scale. He says, I don't want that for you. So I'm going to save you from this moment and then I'm going to invite you to begin your own comeback. Maybe you don't think it's possible to be a godly woman, but it is. I'm telling you it is. And what I say is more real than anything you think or feel. So he says to her, hey, here's your comeback. It starts now. You say to yourself, I, uh, you know, I can't, can a leopard change his spots? Yes, Jesus says. And yours can begin right here and right now. That's the Christmas story, is that God wants to start a comeback in you and me. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. And he's come to lead your comeback. Can I invite you to bow your head and close your eyes with me as we prepare to close service? Give yourself and those around you just a sacred space. And let me ask you if there aren't in your heart some moments that when you remember them, stir up a deep shame. Maybe that shame is not something that a lot of people know about, but you know and you know God knows. And because of that, There's a hesitation. There's a reluctance. You say to yourself, man, I don't know if there's a comeback from that. Jesus says there is. And Jesus offers it to you right here and right now. He is the living God. He's in this moment. He can hear your heart. And he says to you, hey, I want to start your comeback today. I want to start your comeback in this moment. I want to teach you how to break that cycle in your life that always leads to losing and bring you bring you into the reality of Emmanuel, God with you. I want you to know me as your best friend. And it begins when you let me be your savior. And let me start your comeback. If that's you, you can say to a living God right now, yes, I want that. Jesus, I want you to be my Savior. I want to start my comeback. You can say that in this moment and he'll hear it. And everything begins. Maybe you just need to say that again. You've said it, but you forgot it. Jesus is here to meet you again. That's what he does. He is our Savior. Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for this Christmas gospel. We thank you that you do what you say and that what you say is so much greater than what we expect. Lord, send us from here today willing to receive your grace and to believe your promise. We pray for that. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me, friends? Yeah. And... uh, that's what happens when Tuesday is sermon day right after Monday night was the Sounders game. Kind of, kind of goes like that, if you can kind of see that. Yeah, this is real stuff. Now may the love of God the Father, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit go with you throughout this week. Go with God, tell someone you love them. Merry Christmas.